Revival. We started last night and we kicked off with a bang. We were blessed by the word of God, which was brought by Pastor Rico Hill. And tonight will be the same as well. But we're so excited to welcome each and every one of you to this virtual experience, whether you're watching on Facebook, whether you're watching on YouTube, whether you're actually in Zoom with a VIP seat. We are so excited that you've joined us and we look forward to seeing how God will bless us tonight as we look to see how Christ is revealed even through the laws of health, even through nature. And it's a reminder of how fearfully and wonderfully that we are made and how much God loves us, that he desires for us to prosper in our bodies, even as our soul is prospering. So we thank you for joining us tonight. If you're ready to receive the word of God on this evening, go ahead and type in the chat. I'm ready to eat. I'm ready to eat. The seeds have been planted. Tonight is night number two, and we're going to feast on the word of God again. And so as we begin the service tonight, we're going to receive our opening prayer by our chaplain, Chaplain Stewart, at this time. So we welcome you and thank you for being here tonight. Praise the Lord. Thank you so much, Pastor Pierre. The word of God says, enter into his gates with thanksgiving and into his courts with praise. Be thankful unto him and bless his name for the Lord. He is good and his mercy endures forever. Father God, we are so grateful. We are truly honored. We are we're so blessed by this privilege, this opportunity to kick off this new week with a pause to reflect on and to learn something anew about you. God, I give you thanks for being such an intentional God. I thank you for your great sacrifice. I thank you that nothing has been forgotten, that everything has been laid out and planned for, and that God, this uh, entire process, this experience that we are having in the world today does not come to you by surprise. So tonight we want to lift up every family represented here on this call. God, I pray that you will give us the evangelistic and, and, and uh, ministerial and mission mindedness to be able to tag text and share this broadcast with someone because God, every one of us at some point in our lives need a measure of hope, healing, happiness. And so God, God, we pray that in this season, that in this week, that someone will be blessed, that tonight, God, that someone on this broadcast, listening or watching on the replay will be blessed. Father, we thank you for your manservant, for the gift, for the knowledge, the wisdom that you have given him. And as we look at the life of Daniel tonight, as we reflect on, on, on who he is and the example he has laid before us, Father, I pray that we will dare to be Daniels in our everyday life for this generation, for this time, this season, this now. Give us the spirit of excellence of Daniel. Give us, God, your wisdom to guide and to power, empower our lives, we pray. Thank you again, Father, for being with us and for the anointing that you will lay upon every person on this call, and especially your manservant, Pastor Rico Hill, what he has poured out, God, I pray that you will pour back into him and that you will bless his ministry as he continues to share this perspective of the gospel, this good news of Jesus Christ. Be with us tonight, we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. 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 And amen. Amen. And amen. Good evening, everybody. Good evening. Good evening. Good evening. Praise God for each and every one of you who have taken the time to join us this evening. We're so excited to have uh, Elder Rico Hill with us one more time. And I don't know about you, but uh, I, I, I'm i going to be eating a whole lot more broccoli because uh, we found out that broccoli uh, is a cruciferous vegetable. It's like the cross stretched out, one going up, one going down, and two going across. Uh, I'm going to be, now I, I like broccoli. Broccoli is actually my favorite. I don't like cauliflower, very honestly. I'm not a cauliflower guy. I like cauliflower rice. That's about all I want with cauliflower. But uh, that cruciferous vegetable, ladies and gentlemen, the cabbage, I'm, a good, I'm good with cabbage. So, so I'm happy about that. But I'm going to add a lot more of that to my diet by the grace of God. So more broccoli, more cabbage, cabbage, more carrots. 
No sugar. I claim it in the name of Jesus. Cut the sugar out. <laughs> so far, so good. I've gone 40 days without sugar by the grace of God. And I, I don't know who's going to join me, but I pray you'll join me. Come on. I pray you'll join me by the grace of God. Remember also, ladies and gentlemen, that at the end of the presentation, uh, we'll have a QA, and uh, a opportunity for you to, you know, uh, ask uh, Elder Rico Hill some questions. Um, you know, things that you may have heard that you may not really clearly understand. Uh, he's here to help us. And I thank God for his ministry. And I thank God for the centrality of the cross, uh, lifting up Jesus, even in our health message. We're also so delighted that we have the health ministry's director from the Alleghenies Conference here with us. Uh, Sister Leah Scott has been uh, a bastion in health ministries in our conference. For those who have been to Allegheny's conference camp meeting and those who have been to her health retreat, the AEC health retreat in the summertime, uh, those who have lost weight, whose diabetes have been corrected as a result of her ministry, we say kudos to her. Thank God for you, Sister Leah. She's gonna bring us some greetings from Allegheny East. She's gonna also uh, share with us a little bit of insight about uh, Pastor Rico Hill. But um, uh, it is my joy, my delight to have Sister Leah Scott with us. Uh, ladies and gentlemen, we pray and hope. Our hope is that this will not just be information because the key is not information. The key is application. After you've heard it, what will you do with it? After we have been taught, after we've been trained, after we've been educated, how will this change our lives? I pray by the grace of God that your life will be changed that my life will be changed for the better as a result of sitting in this seminar, in this training, in this preaching series with uh, Pastor Rico Hill. So come on, let's go, let's go, let's go, let's go. We're fired up, we're good to go. Feed me, feed me with knowledge, with information, with good stuff, so that my body and my mind will be right by the grace of God. Ladies and gentlemen, Sister Leah Scott, then we're gonna have special music, I believe, and then uh, we will have Pastor Rico Hill. Leah, where are you, dear? Come on board. Oh, that that was a great, great words from you. And if everybody was doing right now and tomorrow and in the past, we are fearfully and wonderfully made. And God wants us to be taken our wonderful bodies, the things that Rico, he is really sharing. We are fearfully again, fearfully and wonderfully. Hey, Leah, uh, I don't know. Hold on, Leah. I don't think we're seeing you. We're hearing you, but I'm not seeing you on my end. Is no. anybody else seeing Leah? Do you see me now? <laughs> uh, we saw a glance of you. We saw a glance up you, but it looked like you got caught up in the rapture immediately thereafter. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know what it says. So click that video button. Click that video button. I'll do uh, it again. There you are. There you are. We got you oh, now. We got okay. you. There you are. Okay. There you are. Well, we want to see our health leader now. We want to see our health ministry's leader now. <laughs> <laughs> it's a blessing because we are fearfully and wonderfully made, and we all know that. But it doesn't happen day after day after day. Our bodies are absolutely amazing. And so what you have done, bringing in a person like Rico Hill to just share how important our bodies are and what we can do to just make people look at us and say, Wow, are you really 80 years old? <laughs> <laughs> but God is so wonderful and he just loves us. So I just wanted to share the, fin the, 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 the body and the way he is presenting. I can't wait myself to hear Rico Hill. And I thank you. I really do. I had a little something. Um, I bring you greeting 
from Allegheny East Conference. Okay? And we are excited. Oops, sorry about that. But, you know, we, we have, well, I'm not even going to go through what um, Pastor Hill is going to, but I, I just appreciate anybody and any pastors that know, they know it's so important to take very well or as much as we can, fearfully and wonderfully made. So we are listening tonight and we're gonna be excited again. And Rico Hill, Pastor Rico Hill, thank you so much for uh, having me. And uh, I, I just can't wait and I'm sure you can't either. And I will say a prayer. Dear Heavenly Father, we thank you, Lord, for these amazing bodies. We thank you for the information that you have given us in the Bible, um, Ellen White. And now it is in the, it's in the world to take care of your bodies. We thank you for all that you've done and all that you will do. And we just know that in the name of Jesus, that we will take the best absolutely through the information, the Bible, and Rico, Pastor Rico Hill. Thank you. Amen. Whoops. We're going to be blessed with special music now, then Rico will bring you word. You've been searching for the kind of cure that this world can't give, and all their answers why just by. But do not help you live The symptoms of guilt for past mistakes There is just one who take the case The Creator alone can attend to the whole human being With health, hope, healing A new should perish and all should arrive by his blood sacrificed for health, hope, and healing. As Jesus means no harm, he gives his blessed right arm, you'll never walk alone. He wants to strengthen you, and so he sent this truth to make your heart and when you lack power to make the change, all he prescribes is a little faith, which will allow you to see you have all that you need when you believe in health, hope, and healing. The new should perish and all should have lied by his blood sacrificed for health, hope, and healing. 
so amazing to see how he restores you and me. First he touches the heart and turns the mind away from doubt. And then the body is made whole for heaven longs to let you know. you know that there is healing, a new beginning, when man will surrender control of body, mind, and soul. There is healing for Jesus was Good evening, everyone. And as the elder said, happy Sunday. I think we um, we enjoy saying happy something. So happy Sunday. And uh, welcome back to the second installment of our Hope, Health, and Healing. That um, the topic and the theme for this uh, week's week of prayer comes from that actual song. It's one of my favorite song by a, a um, it's an original song by an artist friend of mine namiko madden out of canada and um he's got a passion for health and the gospel and when i thought about doing this um this series i thought i can think of no better theme because we've adopted this as a means of evangelism actually and when we go uh our team, when we go out and go door to door, uh, rather than creating a bias and a barrier, something that would cause us to have difficulties and challenges in reaching the people, instead of saying we're from this or that church, we say we are from the H3 project. And we find that when we say we're from the H3 project and they say, well, what's that? We say, well, we are a group of people who are passionate about the health of this community and it stands for hope health and healing are you looking for any of those and you find that no one ever turns down the idea of receiving hope receiving health or receiving healing and as i mentioned last night a wise man once said that he who has health has hope and he who has hope has everything tonight is sunday second installment, and we're going to look at the life of Daniel. The book of Daniel is a book of prophecy and a book of stories. And they combine to create a beautiful picture for us about not only the goodness of God, the power of God, the attention of God, the love of God, uh, and how he attends to those who follow him. But it also teaches us about his power, teaches us about um, how man responds to God, the God who has fearfully and wonderfully made him, as uh, the good doctor has, has mentioned. Um, so we want to get right into it tonight. We have a lot to cover, and I know that we want to allow some time for some questions. So let's have a word of prayer and let's get started. Father in heaven, we thank you once again for this opportunity. And we just pray now that you would be with us. Teach us, teach me, even as I attempt to be a mouthpiece for you. The task is daunting. In fact, it's impossible. No man can do it. And that is why the Bible tells us, not by might, nor by power, but by my spirit, saith the Lord of hosts. So with this in mind, Lord, we come to you pleading, asking, Lord, that you would 
Fulfill the promise that you've made to us, that if we being evil know how to give good gifts to our children, how much more shall our heavenly Father give the gift of the Holy Spirit to them that ask? And we are asking in Jesus' name. Amen. Just a reminder, tomorrow, Monday, the blessings of nothingness. That's a very curious title, but I plan to impact that by God's grace and really, really get to the heart of the kind of revival that we need. Tuesday, are you thirsty yet? The Bible tells us in Matthew chapter 5 and verse 6, blessed are them that hunger and thirst after righteousness. For righteousness, Wednesday, we'll look at councils on diet and faith. How does your diet affect your faith? Oh, that should be a good one as we go to the book of Numbers and we look to see what happened in the experience of Israel. And we're told there in 1 Corinthians chapter 10 that the things that happened to ancient Israel were for examples for us for the end of time. That's a serious statement. Thursday, the role of health in the last days, speaking of the last days. In fact, we're going to touch on some of that today as we draw a parallel between Daniel, Daniel's diet, Daniel's choices, Daniel's understanding, and the last days, and the people of God who are now looking to the soon return of Jesus Christ. Friday, your light has come. That's based on Isaiah chapter 60 and verses 1, 2, and 3. Powerful stuff there. We're going to cover that. And then finally, we'll end with all things made new. This is my hope. This is my prayer that as we have gone, after we have gone through all of these messages, then people will be saying, uh, like that, that centurion guard, what must I do to be saved? What must I do to go forward? And then we will look to Jesus as the author and the finisher of our faith. I remember the first time I attended Church of the Oranges, and I came there to, to speak for the first time, and I will never forget it, how it seemed to me, at least in my mind as I replay it, like I had stepped out and was looking over a sea of people with their arms all folded, saying, go ahead, tell me what I can't eat. I'll never forget it. I share the story everywhere I go and tell people about how, what that experience was like, as I shared not so much about what you can't eat, what you can't do, because no one ever responds favorably to that. What people do respond to is the love of Jesus. People respond to how God has made us, has fashioned us, fearfully and wonderfully made, according to Psalm 139 and verse 14. So in the same way, we're going to look to Jesus. We're going to look for Jesus. We're going to look for his love. As we go through this series, and even tonight, we want to see Jesus. We want to keep it, as the pastor said, Christocentric. The cross of Calvary, that's what matters. That's the only thing that we got, is the cross of Jesus. So that's just a little bit of, of, um, of introduction, but let's have a little bit of review. I gave some anchor text last night, and this was sort of one, I didn't refer to it as an anchor text, but it serves as one as we get started here. And then I'll give you the other three, just as a bit of review. Maybe someone is joining us for the first time and they need the foundation because foundations are important. You can't build a house without a firm foundation, right? Every house must have a firm foundation. In fact, Jesus said, a wise man built upon the rock. And then when the seas blew and the winds blew and all of those things became, came crashing down, he was unshakable, unmovable. And when we plant ourselves on the solid rock, Jesus Christ, the Bible tells us we shall not be moved. So we don't want to be moved. We don't want to be shaken in any way. We want to stand firm because the Bible tells us he that endures to the end, the same shall be saved. Mark 13, 13, and also in the book of Matthew. Romans chapter 20, 1, verse 20. Romans chapter 1, verse 20. Let's make sure that we have it all clear in our minds. You can turn there in your Bible if you like to. 
I'll quote it for you, but it says, for the invisible things of him, who's the him? It's Jesus. For the invisible things of him from the creation of the world are clearly seen by the things that are made. That is a paradox. That seems like something that you just can't really reconcile when you think about it. How can invisible things be seen? How can invisible things be seen from the creation of the world or the earth by the things that were made? If they're invisible, how can you see them? See, understand this, beloved. There are things that God did not reveal right away. You understand that. We know that the Bible tells us in Galatians chapter 4 and verse 4, in the fullness of time, God sent forth his son, born of a woman. So we must understand that God didn't reveal everything. And we must look at these things in the context of a great controversy. There is a great controversy going on and God doesn't show his hand all at once. So it's called the mystery of the ages. The patriarchs didn't fully understand it. They were looking for something, a Messiah to come, but they didn't know exactly how, even though much of the scriptures, when you put it all together, here a little, there a little, precept upon precept, line upon line. When you do that, you begin to see how Jesus was going to come the first time, how he's going to come the second time. But people missed it. And this is especially important for the last days. And brothers and sisters, you know that we are living in the last days. These are the final moments of Earth's history. So we, when we're talking about revival, we're talking about revival with a purpose. Revival with a purpose. Not just, oh, we heard something and we felt, didn't you? No, we must now have the kind of experience where we take it and as was mentioned, it becomes a part of us and we go forward to conquer because I tell you, the devil's not playing. The devil's not playing. He's playing, well, Actually, if I remember a quote, my mind, the Holy Spirit has dropped into my mind that Ellen White does say that the, the devil is playing a game of keeps. So he is playing a game, but it's a game where he is looking to win and you lose. We are a part of this great controversy. So here's why I'm going into all of that. This idea of the invisible things, listen very carefully, the invisible things of him from the creation of the world are clearly seen. So last night we saw something that's clearly seen that he made that points to him. Why does he do this? Why does he hide himself and characteristics of himself in cabbage or in berries or in nuts and seeds? Why does he do that? He does that because it's a great controversy. Notice in the Bible what it says in 2 Corinthians chapter 4. Turn there with me in your Bibles. Very quickly, I don't want to spend a lot of time here. We got much more to cover. I'm just setting it up so that those who missed last night can see how we're using the Bible to combine the health message along with the gospel. The right arm of the gospel is the health message. And they go together as the hand is to the body. You cannot separate them. So that's why we're having just this little exercise for just a few moments. But I want you to turn to 2 Corinthians chapter 4. And we're going to begin in verse... Three, Second Corinthians chapter four and verse three. Second Corinthians chapter four and verse three. The Bible says, but if our gospel be hid, it is hid to them that are lost, in whom the God of this world hath blinded the minds of them which believe not, lest the light of the glorious gospel of Christ, who is the image of God, should shine unto them. So Jesus knowing according to even Isaiah chapter 46, 9 and, 10, 9 and 10, where it says, remember the former things of old, for I am God. I am God and there's none else. Declaring the end from the beginning and from ancient times, the things that are not yet done, saying my counsel shall stand. So Jesus, who knows the end from the beginning, 
He knows what the devil is going to do. He knew that this would be an issue at the end of time, especially as people are moving further and further away from the gospel, further and further away from Christianity. Christianity has become somewhat of a subculture in the country that has printed upon its money in God we trust. Let you go out and say someone's behavior, their sexual behavior, their gender confusion is a sin and see what happens in this cancel culture. Why? Because we are in a great controversy and the things of God don't matter to people anymore. So Jesus, knowing the end from the beginning, he placed almost like crumbs, breadcrumbs, if you will. You catch that? Breadcrumbs. He's the breath of life. I mean, the, 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 the bread of life. He left breadcrumbs for us to find our way back to him, to see him in a world that's being blinded. The minds are being blinded by the God of this world, and we know that that is Satan. So understanding this, God says in Romans through Paul, Romans chapter one, verse 20, the invisible things of him are clearly seen from the, or the invisible things of him from the creation of the world are clearly seen being understood by the things that are made. Now, let's not stop there. It also says, goes on to say, even his Godhead and eter eternal power and Godhead, his eternal power and Godhead. Now, that sounds to me like the power is associated with what Paul says in Romans chapter 1 and verse 16, where he says, for I am not ashamed of the gospel of Jesus Christ, for it is the power of God. So the power of God is the gospel. The gospel is God's power to save you and I from sin, to save you and I from destruction. That's the power of God. How did he do it? He did it on the cross. The Bible tells us in 1 Corinthians chapter 15, verses 1 through 3, even 4, it says that Paul says, I preached the gospel, the same gospel I preached unto you, that I heard I preached unto you. And that was the gospel that Jesus died was buried and was resurrected. So the gospel is the is the uh, sacrifice of Christ on the cross, his burial, and the fact that he came up, ascended to heaven so that you and I can do the same thing. Praise God. So we have an understanding. This is our foundation. Our foundation is we're looking for Jesus and we're looking for him in the things that were made. That's the sunlight. That's the air that's, that, that we breathe. Oh boy, I had recently... Maybe some of you can identify with this. I had COVID. I had COVID over the holidays, and it ended with a case of pneumonia. And boy, was I happy to be able to breathe normally the fresh air after I overcame it through medical missionary work, by the way. So I'm thankful to God. But these are the things that God has given to us in order for us to see him, because they all represent him, the son. He's the son of righteousness, the fresh air. He talks about the way, the moving of the Holy Spirit. That's his spirit. The water. He's the fountain of living water. So everything that was made represents Christ. Shouldn't we be able to find it also in food? Absolutely. Absolutely. So we look for not a picture of Jesus per se, but we look for his loving character, the fact that he loves us so much that he gave himself to us. He gave himself upon a cross. He suffered, bled, and died. He, as I mentioned last night, we see the leaves turning red in the time of the fall, commemorating the fall of man, and we see that the majority of them are red. Why? Because it's the blood of Jesus. So this is foundational for our understanding. And we must ask ourselves, what is that understanding? Last night, we began to see that science is pointing out the things that are in the Bible. Science is beginning to see that which the devil has tried to blind us by or with. Dr. William Lee, MD, wrote this book, and I recommended it. I'm going to recommend another book tonight that Jesus recommended. 
But his book is called Eat to Beat Disease. And here, listen to me carefully, friends. When we start to see the world, because this man's not a Christian, when we begin to see the world starting to promote the things from Genesis chapter 1, the things from Genesis chapter 3, and not go to Genesis chapter 9. When we begin, and Genesis chapter 9 was when God gave permission, his permissive will, not his perfect will, but his permissive will, where he allowed the inhabitants who were descendants of Noah to actually eat flesh foods. And they're not mentioning those in the way that they're mentioning the things from Genesis chapter one and Genesis chapter three. I'm talking about the original diet and the restoration diet that came after that. We looked at that last night. We saw the three diets of the Bible, Genesis 129, the original diet, Genesis 318, the restoration diet. Mm -hmm. We saw the beautiful connection of how the seeds was the primary part of the diet that was in the beginning, fruits, nuts, grains, and seeds. But in the same way that the herb, when it yielded seed, you weren't supposed to eat the herb, it wasn't a part of it. So then you have to deduce that it's not really talking about the thing that produces it, it's talking more about the action of what it does. And the herb yielded seeds, and the fruit yielded seeds. We understand that, right? So again, tonight is going to be primarily about the seeds because we find that the seed is Christ. But I want to show you tonight how that seed is even understood by Daniel, right? And then we saw that in Genesis chapter 3 and verse 18, we saw the restoration diet where it dealt with the introduction into the diet as pastor was talking about eating more broccoli. We saw that the cruciferous vegetables were now a prescription. Yes, a prescription. Why? Because now man is going to suffer sickness and disease. And now, as I shared last night, there's so much research on this idea of cruciferous vegetables that are high in antioxidants, high in sulforaphane, high in fiber, high in all these things, these nutrients, that actually fight cancer. Now, Adam didn't have to worry about cancer. He lived to 900 some years. But God was doing something there in the garden. Listen, he was doing something in the garden that was going to actually be for our benefit in the last days. And now they're discovering it. This is how you know when the world starts to reveal God more than his people, you better pay attention because they're getting right down to it. And many of that's why we're seeing so many plant-based uh, plant summits and these huge conferences and events that take place and people come by the thousands from all over the world. Um, in the last couple of years, just before COVID, I traveled all over Europe and I couldn't believe it. I'd go to France, vegan restaurants. I'd go to Prague, several plant-based restaurants. I was in Switzerland, one of the best ones I ever went to. They're everywhere. People are beginning to actually come into an understanding of what we already knew. God help us. And I don't think that we should say, sometimes I hear people say, oh, they, they're taking our health message. No, 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 no. <laughs> health message belongs to God. He gives it to those who he plans to use for his glory. Amen. Now, first, let's talk about seeds real quick. Um, oh, not real quick, but let's just kind of look at that first that first idea of the concept of the seeds. Now, the first thing I want to point out, actually, before I do that, I should give you those other um, those other texts, those anchor texts, and they're foundational to our understanding as we arrive at what it means to have understanding. And they're found, and you might want to write these down. I'm going to share them every night at the top because I, I, I truly believe they're foundational for us to be able to grasp these concepts, right? And the first one is found is found in Proverbs chapter four and verse seven. It says, wisdom is a principal thing. Therefore, get wisdom. And in all thy getting, get understanding, the Bible says. Right. So you can get wisdom. And I like I liken the word wisdom to information. And we often are intellectual giants uh, with information. Right. We have information overload. 
We have so much information. In fact, we as Seventh-day Adventist Christians, we love information. We love a good seminar. We love to go to them and take copious notes and take those notes and take them back home and put them up on our shrine of notes. And a lot of times we don't apply them. But as has already been mentioned, we need to make application. This is not revival for revival's sake. This is revival for survival. Did you hear what I just said? This is revival for survival. Now, that's the first anchor text. The next one is found in, also in the book of Proverbs, um, the wise man Solomon is the wisdom of Solomon. It says, and it gives an under, it gives a definition of understanding. I like to do that. I like to allow the Bible to answer itself or define itself you know, to define its words. Uh, that's what it's for. And Psalms and Proverbs are great books to define terms that the Bible uses so that we can have understanding. Amen. So Proverbs chapter nine, verse 10 helps us to understand this thing of understanding. And it says the fear of the Lord is the beginning of wisdom and knowledge of the holy or holy one is understanding. So knowledge is understanding and understanding is knowledge. And God wants us to have the knowledge of him. That would be understanding. Now, what do we mean by that? Knowledge of him about what? Well, what is the greatest thing that he's ever done? He loved us and loves us. In fact, he's up there now in the most holy place now pleading for us. The Bible tells us in Romans chapter 8 and verse 34 that he is making intercession for us. Now, right now, he's at the right hand of the Father pleading for us. Hebrews tells us he saves to the uttermost because he is the ever liveth to make intercession for us. That means he's pleading our cause, representing us. You know, I read a wonderful statement in the spirit of prophecy, and it said, and you'll be blessed by this. It says that you, listen to me, friends, you should never, ever think about what God thinks of you. Because if you do that, you'll always be sad. You'll be sorrowful. You'll think about your life. You'll think about the things that you've done. You'll think about all the headaches and all the trauma and all the stuff that you carry as a burden. But Jesus says, come unto me, all ye that labor and are heavy laden. I will give you rest. If you're heavy burdened, burdened down with the things of this world, things about your past. He says, don't think about what God thinks of you. Think about what he thinks about his son. Because when he looks at his son there at his right hand, he sees you. And when he looks at you, he sees his son. So you never have to worry about, does God love me? No, he loves his son. So all you need to, that's all you need to think about is how much he loves you. Final text is in Psalm 100 and verse 3. The Bible says in Psalm 100 and verse 3, it says, know you not that the Lord, he is God. It is he that has made us and not we ourselves. We are his, uh, his people and the sheep of his pasture. And we know that as sheep, the Bible tells us in John chapter 10. Yeah, chapter 10. It tells us that his sheep hear his voice and they follow him. We want to follow Jesus. Amen. Now, last night I said, as we deals with the, uh, those are your anchor texts, by the way. Last night, I mentioned um, how the original diet of fruit, nuts, and seeds was primarily a diet of seeds, and that the fruit part of it was just a delivery system. In other words, it was a way, and we don't really know the kind of fruit that was there in the garden in the beginning, but I imagine they were like these kinds of fruit that easily are delivered into your body, and they have health promoting benefits, and you don't even have to worry about them. It's just how God works, right? He knows that sometimes we'll make things hard for ourselves, you know? So he finds ways to make it easy, right? Um, you know, it's amazing that somehow, some way, God made certain things in the shape of those things that they're good for. For example, you look at a walnut. I like to have those every day. It's a seed. And when you look at it, it's like two halves of the brain. And we find that it is the healthiest thing. One of the healthiest things for the brain. It's a good 
healthy brain food, right? You look at the carrot and you see that it looks like the iris of the eye. And then guess what? It's good for the eyes. You look at the avocado and it looks like a woman's womb and it's good for reproductive health. It's a good fat. We find that uh, celery is like, it's all bony and whatnot, and it's good for the bones. And you can just kind of look at all these things. Even the tomato looks like the chambers of the heart and it's good for the heart as well as things like the prostate and things like that. And we'll talk about those seeds in that uh, tomato in just a second here. But look at the strawberry, strawberry fruit seeds. I mentioned that last night. I said that on uh, average, the average number of seeds, look at those seeds on that strawberry, the average number of seeds that's placed right on that strawberry, which you never worry about, you just taste the flavor of that thing, especially if you get one that's nice and sweet. And you eat it, and you're not worried about those seeds, but God is delivering something into your system that is for your health. And there's that tomato. This was powerful. Look at that. There's that tomato that looks like two the chambers of the heart, right? And this was a study that was done. It says tomatoes are protective against heart attacks. Why? One of the reasons is because of the yellow fluid which surrounds the seeds. The fluid concentrates a compound that suppresses platelet activation. And that's the thing that triggers blood clots and cause heart attacks in the first place, right? So we see that God has placed in there something that is delivered into your body that's good for your health, all right? Now, I'm just going to hit this really quick because I'm just kind of setting it up and showing that the things of God, the character of God, the character of Christ, we begin to see that God has a way. All right, I think somebody is saying that the pastor should share his screen. It's, 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 um, can someone let me know if they're talking about me or the other pastor? Pastor Stoddard. Is my screen being shown or not? And I, ho I hope you're not just seeing this now. Oh, wow, wow, wow. You can see my screen, you can't see my screen. It it's good if someone keeps their camera on so that I can see what you're saying. Okay. All right, pardon this interruption but I'm going to try to fix this problem. Church clerk, won't you go ahead and speak so I can hear you? Oh, let's see, let's see, let's see. We, I haven't cannot, to we cannot see your screen, uh, Rico. Oh, please! If, if I'm talking through the slides, please let me know earlier so that I can uh, <laughs> so I can I can I can correct that in a timely fashion, because I'm the things that I'm showing. I want to make sure that you're connecting with them. Let's see now. I'm sharing my screen right now. Can you see? Are you seeing a kiwi? Yes, sir. We're good. All right, beautiful. All right, there's that kiwi that I was just talking about. Do you see the strawberry? Kiwi, kiwi. We're still on kiwi. We haven't seen the strawberry yet. Hmm. Not sure why that is. Let me stop sharing one more time and try to share and see if we can correct this. Okay, you see the kiwi? Do you see the strawberry? Yes, sir. Yes. All right, okay, fantastic. All right, anyway, I, it's, it's a very mouth-watering image and I would not want you to have missed it. So I'm glad that you're seeing it in, its, in, its, in all of its glory. Okay, so you see that. By the way, a strawberry is also a berry. It's, a, it's, it's strawberries are berries. Uh, grapes are berries. I mentioned pomegranates are berries. Then I talked about the tomato and the two chambers of the heart, right? 
And now berries. Are you there? Are we seeing berries? Give me a thumbs up. Berries. Beautiful, beautiful, beautiful. All right. You know, now, according to this Harvard University study, it says that that berries are the um, is the healthiest fruit, and it's a good brain food because it crosses the blood brain barrier, and it's actually very, very good. And people who are concerned as we begin to age, it actually slows brain aging by two and a half years. Wow, can your drugs do that? Can drugs do that? But God in his great love, he creates something that crosses the blood brain barrier that is high in antioxidants and it actually slows brain aging. Why? Because it's full of antioxidants. And one of the, the problems with Alzheimer's and dementia, which many people suffer from as they age, is the fact that they, it's basically brain inflammation. And antioxidants actually help to suppress that. I tell you what, I have to have blueberries every day. I don't want my brain aging. I eat blueberries every day. I don't care how much they cost. I'll go right to Whole Foods. They can cost $20. I just send the bill to the Lord because he says, I desire that you be in health. So I know that he wants, he wants me to have them more than I even want to have them. All right, let's keep going. And then last night, I talked about the relationship between the cabbage and the cross. You see the cabbage? All right, good, good, good. We talked about that. Um, <clears throat> now, let's get back to seeds. Uh, pumpkin seeds. Pumpkin seeds are amazing. You know what they're good for? Pumpkin seeds actually, naturally, they actually destroy parasites. Now, everybody gets those just by living. But if you eat paras, I mean, if you eat pumpkin seeds, not parasites, but if you eat pumpkin seeds daily, you will actually, what it does is it paralyzes them and then they can pass through your system. And there are people who suffer, you know, severely as if a, if a parasite grows and grows and grows and then becomes problematic in your system, gets in the bloodstream, can go up to the brain and cause all kinds of issues. But if you eat a steady diet of pumpkin seeds, they actually paralyze them and actually can eliminate, help you eliminate them from your body. They're also good for men for prostate health. Why? Because they're high in zinc. They're high in zinc. And in this COVID world that we live in, it's good to have zinc every day, probably a higher dose than in the pumpkin seed. But nonetheless, if you want to get it also nutritionally from diet, you can get it from pumpkin seeds. You see flax seeds? You know, seeds have become a wonderful thing. Chia seeds, they call it a superfood. People like chia pudding and things like that. Mm -hmm. And then you've got pumpkin seeds and flax seeds. Flax seeds, one table of ground flax seeds lowers blood, um, blood pressure two to three times better than the leading blood pressure medication. It reduces inflammation, mm -hmm. um, reduces risk of the two uh, offending cancers, uh, respectively for, for women and men. Uh, breast cancer for women and prostate cancer for men. And it is good in helping you be regular. Great to throw it in your salad, put it in your, um, in your smoothie, your green smoothie uh, or your juicing. And it's amazing. Now here's some studies on cancer prevention that deal with seeds, nuts. Because remember, fruits, nuts, grains, seeds, grains like rice, brown rice, um, seeds, all seeds, are things that you put in, immerse them in water, they actually will sprout, right? And they will reproduce after their own kind, according to the Bible, right? So that would include your seeds, your nuts, your grains, and your beans. So this was a study, epic study. Um, 478,000 people, women consuming, I really wanna move this out of the way. It's blocking my screen. I can't quite read what I'm looking at here. Okay, anyway. Um, so 478,000 people, women consuming one and a half servings of nuts and seeds per day, two servings of tree nuts per week, reduced cancer, by, cancer risk by 31%. Yeah? I just changed my slide. Give me a thumbs up, Avril. Soybeans, breast cancer prevention, University of Missouri and Iowa State University. The goal was to activate tumor suppressive gene. Um, the sample was with 34 healthy women 
This was a prospective randomized double-blind clinical trial study, and they gave them high dose or low dose of soy bioactive two times per day. Low dose was the equivalent of 1.2 cups edamame. That's, and, and that is soybean in its, in its raw state. This is not soybean or soy burger, or it, we're talking about edamame, as you know, in its raw state. So, and high doses was four cups. Uh, even the low dose was found to suppress cancer, dream, cancer genes um, that had been turned on. Um, so University of Toronto, they took uh, a sample size of uh, 1,253 men. They evaluated intakes of nuts, beans, and seeds. One serving of nuts and beans. And beans was equal to the equivalent of two tablespoons per day. And again, notice how God in his love has created something that is reducing the kind of cancers that we're dealing with. 31% reduction of the risk of prostate cancer for men. Just wanted to give you some science and some statistics. It's always good to do that, but I also want to just get down to the spiritual aspect of this because it's beautiful. It really is beautiful, especially as it relates to Daniel and how we get there. Just stick with me for just a few moments. So <clears throat> consider with me when God created Adam. I showed you this slide last night. I like this slide because it just, it takes... It takes me, the closest thing that takes my imagination to seeing God, the God of heaven, bend down in a muddy, on a muddy ground and begin to form and fashion a man. That's important. Friends, that's super important. You know, when we talk about um, light and creation, which we'll do on Friday, you know, God comes and from the evidence, scientific evidence and biblical evidence, when Jesus was creating the earth, he came and came close to the earth and he began to create. He began to speak things into existence, but he did it from like out there somewhere. That's important to understand. Now, the reason why the biblical evidence of him doing that was because he says, let there be light on that first day. And there was light and that light was his own presence and it lit up the earth the, the the vegetation could grow and the things could take place and there could be light because his presence and we understand that from the parallel of when we get to heaven the bible tells us there will be no need for a sun because we will be in the the sunlight will shine forth from the presence of the throne of god Right. So Jesus stood afar off and he began to speak. Let there be light. Let there be water that divides the water. Let there be uh, dry land. Let there be. But when he began to make man, he came down. He put a sun in the sky to replace his brilliance. And he began to form and fashion man with his own hands. For what purpose? For what purpose, I ask? Because remember, understanding is pointing to God. It helps us to understand, to, to, to be able to process something about his character. Not just information, but why? We have to ask ourselves the question, why? If we want understanding. Why'd you do that, Lord? Have you ever considered that when Jesus was forming Adam, when he was making a man, that he was creating a body that he himself could dwell in. If you've considered it, praise the Lord. If you've considered it, if you've not thought deeply about it, start to think deeply. If you've never considered it before, think about this idea that Jesus was forming a man that he knew 4,000 years later, he could actually dwell in that body and exist. But not only that, but that he could, after he was crucified, had a glorified body, could go back to heaven and send the Holy Spirit and the Holy Spirit could do the exact same thing. Dwell in us. This is amazing when you think about it. And if 
God was going to create a man that would have the kind of optimal health that he himself, divine as he is, could actually step in himself and live and walk and talk and do all the things that we do so that he could be touched with our infirmities, so that he could be made like unto his brothers, then there must have been provisions made, listen, that would allow that body to exist and be healthy long enough for him to come. Not only that, he must have given something, fresh air, he must have given something, sunshine, he must have provided something, water, he must have provided something, diet, so that that body could house divinity. Oh, I want you to think differently about your body tonight. I want you to think differently about the character of God. When he made you, this was not something that was an accident. He was making a man so that he could come, if it was necessary, dwell within that man, and then bring the scene of misery to an end and eradicate sin through the universe by using us. You got to keep that in mind. So diet was not just something God said, oh, they're going to need to eat. No, he said they must have health, sunshine, water, fresh air and food in the way that I can live in them. Oh, you don't know what I'm talking about. Go over to Second Corinthians real quick. I'm going to come back here on the slides. Second Corinthians chapter six, second Corinthians chapter six. Listen what it says in verse 15, you're familiar with this text? Are you there? Se I'm sorry, 1 Corinthians. No, I don't want that one. I want 2 Corinthians. 2 Se Corinthians chapter 6. They both say the same thing, really. But I like, I like the one in 2 Corinthians a little better. They're both in, in chapter 6. But notice what it says in verse 16. 2 Corinthians chapter 6 and verse 16, it says, And what agreement hath the temple of God with idols? For ye are the temple, your body. It was never about brick and mortar. It was never about a church building. It was always about you. And what agreement hath the temple of God with idols? For ye are the temple of the living God. As God hath said, I will dwell in them. And then he gets specific. I will walk in them and I will be their God and they shall be my people according to the covenant that was made with Abraham. You shall be my people and I shall be your God. So God wants to live in us. The seed wants to live in us. I'm switching slides. You see that seed? You see those seeds? Give me a thumbs up, Avril. Do you see kidney bean seeds? We see the seeds. Oh, okay. Thank you. Yeah, just give me a thumbs up. I just need to know because, you know, technology is funny. But now, you know, in the book of Daniel, in the book of Daniel, you know, Jesus, Jesus actually gave a, a recommendation for a book. Did you know that? Jesus actually gave a recommendation. I gave a recommendation earlier about this idea of the book, um, Eat to Beat Disease. But Jesus also had a recommendation for a book. And he recommended the book of Daniel right there in Matthew chapter 24. He says, therefore, when you see the abomination of desolation spoken of by Daniel, the prophet standing in the holy place, whosoever reads, let him understand. So Jesus said, now, I want you to read the book of Daniel. And when you read it, I want you to understand. And remember, our foundation is we must understand something about him. In other words, even though the book of Daniel is a book of prophecies, is a book of stories, but ultimately it's a story about who? It's a story about Jesus. And there's something about his character that he wants us to understand there in the book of Daniel. So <clears throat> let's look at this a little closer. When Daniel and the Hebrew boys actually were brought there, I should go here. The Bible tells us that as for these young four men, talking about Daniel, Meshach, Shadrach, and Abednego, 
God gave them knowledge and skill in all literature and wisdom, and he gave them understanding in all visions and dreams. Isn't that something, right? Now, so this idea of the book of Daniel, a book of prophecies and stories, powerful stories. We raise up our kids on the stories of Daniel. We, we, uh, we sing songs about Daniel. They're in the song book, right? In the hymn book. Now, what does Daniel mean? What does his name mean? His name means God is my judge. We need to know that. God is my judge. Now, as the story goes, Jeremiah, the prophet, was prophesying about how Jerusalem was going to be destroyed by Nebuchadnezzar, King Nebuchadnezzar. And he told them again and again and again until they threw him into a pit, into a dungeon, and they wanted to kill him because he was prophesying that. It wasn't good news, friends. It wasn't. It wasn't good news for uh, the king of, 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 um, you know, of, the Isra of the Israelites, forgive me. It wasn't good news in, in the same way that it's not good news that, that there is something that's going to take place uh, before Jesus comes. It's not good news when we consider that the Bible tells us in Matthew chapter 24 that there shall be a time of trouble. And Daniel himself says that there shall be a time such as never was before. That, we don't like that news. And when everyone, whenever someone starts to talk about it, it doesn't feel good. In fact, I believe that most of us as seven, can I just be real? I believe that most of us as Seventh-day Adventists, we want this to just be how it all happens. We want to go to church. We want to be back in the church so that one day, some beautiful Sabbath, spring morning, or afternoon after church service is over and we walk outside right after the service and we're praising God and we look up and we say, oh, the clouds are unfolding as a scroll. It's Jesus. He's come to take us home. I believe that that's what we want. But the Bible tells before tell us before that happens, there must be a time of trouble. It's sort of like what was happening for the, the children of Israel. They were being told a time of trouble is coming and it's going to be terrible. You need to do certain things. You need to do things in preparation. Listen to me carefully. Most of the parables of Jesus are about preparation. We keep the Sabbath because not only does it sanctify us, but it prepares us. Every single week we have a rehearsal of preparation. Jesus talked about the 10 virgins. Five wise, five foolish, but they were all sleeping. And the moral of the story is five of them were prepared and five of them were not. Jesus gives lots of stories, some things that we don't even fully understand. Like when he talks about when this time of trouble comes or when this abomination of desolation happens, that's spoken of by Daniel. When he speaks about that, he says, pray that your flight not be when on the sabbath or on the in the winter time now on the sabbath we get we shouldn't be all stressed out running for the hills and it's the sabbath right what he says also that pray that it your flight not be in winter we're in winter time right now do you know what that means there's something so deep in its simplicity why does he use the verb flight what flies? Now, he couldn't have been talking about airplanes because, you know what? They didn't exist at that time. He spoke about the things that were, that were pertinent and cultural at the time and that were visible and available for him to make reference to. And he says, make, pray that your flight. So the only thing that took flight that he could have been referring to were birds. And when the Bible speaks of birds, it's usually talking about migratory birds, like you find in Proverbs chapter 26, where it talks about the swallow. That's a migratory bird. And those birds, they take flight before winter. They make preparation. In, in other words, if you see them still in your area when it's winter, they didn't make preparation and they did not leave in time. 
So Jesus, even there, is giving us a, a message when he points us to Daniel and he says, make sure you understand. Well, first of all, the local literal meaning of this abomination of desolation was, of course, when the Romans came and they planted their standard there in the holy place. And shortly thereafter, there was the siege and Jerusalem was destroyed in AD 70. But what about spiritual worldwide? What about for our day? What is he saying to us? He's saying also, when you begin to see the Sabbath, the holy Sabbath being usurped or removed by a secular, unholy, day of worship, Sunday that is, then you need to know that things are about to get really, really hot. Is that happening now? Absolutely. And I hate to tell you, friends, some of us like to say, we like to say we're going to get back to normal. Well, that would be counter what Jesus says. He says that there would be pestilence. There would be rumors of wars. There would be wars and rumors of wars. There would be violence like it was in the days of Noah. There would be uh, sexual immorality like in the days of Lot. Are we not seeing all these things? And what does it matter to us? And what are we to understand as he points to Daniel? Well, let's go look at Daniel for just a few moments. Now, the Bible says in Daniel chapter 1 and in verse 2, watch this. It says, the Lord... The Lord gave Jehoiakim, king of Judah, into his hand with part of the vessels of the house of God, which he carried into the land of Shinar, to the house of his God. And he brought the vessels into the treasure house of his God. Now, I've read that many times, but I said, Lord, I want understanding. I want to know what you mean. Why do you give this history? Why does it point to this and then go right into the life and stories of Daniel? Now, pause right there for just a moment. Now, you understand that we are the last church of Bible prophecy. We are the remnant church of Bible prophecy, the church of Laodicea. We are that church. Sometimes we don't like it because of the characteristics of that church, but we are the last church. We like being the last church. We like being the church. We like being the church with the three angels' messages. And if so, we have to understand that like Daniel, there's a parallel. Revelation and Daniel are to be studied together. And now we want to see what is the message that God spoke to Daniel and gave to him as story and then prophecy to point us to the last church and have us draw on those parallels and have understanding not only about what preparations we make, but also something about God's loving character for his people. So, Laodicea means a people judged. Daniel means God is my judge. See the parallels, right? So, when Daniel actually starts, it starts with chapter one. And we want to understand something about it. Now, before we get there and begin to bring this to a close and make our final points and then answer some questions, because we don't want to miss that. Let me just give you a few more points and bring the idea home to you. In the book of Revelation chapter 14, in the book of Revelation chapter 14, it tells us something very, very important. That's the three angels' messages. And in verse 7, it says, fear God and give glory to him for the hour of his judgment is coming and worship him who made, made, heaven and earth and the sea and the fountains of waters. I hope you're getting that. So now the three angels message points right back to the God who made stuff, including our diet, including the sunshine, including all of the health principles. That's why you cannot truly believe in the three angels messages and not believe in health reform. You can't do it because it's there right in the center of it. It points us back to God who made the creator God. But even before that, in verse, set, um, in verse 6, it says, And I saw another angel fly in the midst of heaven, having the everlasting gospel to preach. Now, again, the everlasting gospel is the fact that God would come and redeem us. Revelation chapter 13 and verse 8 says that he was the lamb slain from the foundation of the world. So therefore, buttress between the fact that he redeems us and he creates us, he's the God who wants us to glorify him. 
Did you catch that? Between the fact that he redeemed us and he created us is the fact that he says, I give glory to me for the hour of my judgment has come. In other words, he's on trial and he's looking for someone to represent him. So I think somebody said it. I think it was uh, Sister Leah Scott when she mentioned when people say, wow, how old are you? I remember that when uh, when Jacob went to Egypt, the Bible says in Genesis that when he came before Pharaoh, the Pharaoh looked at him and said, how old are you? You know, Egyptians only lived to be about 40 years of age. That was the average age of an Egyptian. Yeah, yeah. But God's people who understood the things of God, they lived much longer to the extent that people were like, wow, how'd you get that old? And I'm always amazed when I see Seventh-day Adventists who are living and believing this thing when they actually are in their 80s and 90s and they're walking around. I was talking to a guy the other day, 81 years old, and he's doing everything, all types of exercise and gym membership. This is what God wants from his people. Now, so the first angel's message tells us to fear God and give glory to him for the hour's judgment has come. Now, this takes us over to, and many scholars agree that in 1 Corinthians chapter 10 and verse 31, it says, whatsoever therefore you eat, or drink, or whatsoever you do, do all to the glory of God. So within the last day message, giving glory to God, there's a temperance message. And that's exactly what was the case with Daniel and the Hebrew boys. But what's deep to me is that in Daniel chapter one and verse two, it says that the vessels were brought from Jerusalem and these vessels were out of the temple of God. In other words, they belonged to God. And I wondered, as I said, why does it start here? And then I went doing some digging and I found this. I found this, can you see that? I hope you can see that. It says the fact that these men, worshipers of Jehovah, were captives in Babylon and that the vessels of God's house had been placed in the temple of the Babylonish gods, was boastfully cited by the victors as evidence that their religion and customs were superior to the religion and the customs of the Hebrews. Right? But notice it continues in Patriarchs and Kings. Yet through the very humiliations that Israel's departure from him had invited, God gave Babylon evidence of his supremacy of the holiness of his requirements and the sure results of obedience. And this testimony he gave, watch this, as alone it could be given through those who were loyal to him, talking about the Hebrew boys. In other words, while they thought that they had won because they took the vessels and they brought the vessels into their temples and they said, look who is the superior God. But what God didn't know, I mean, what God, the devil didn't know was that Jesus had some vessels, some other vessels who actually came with that and actually showed who was superior. And that was Daniel and the Hebrew boys. And in chapter one, they said, give us pulse to eat. That's what they asked for. And do you know what they were asking for? They were asking for, let me see if I can jump out of this real quick and show you going back and show you this. Notice this in closing, as we close, he said, give us pulse to eat and water to drink. Now that word is from in the Strong's Concordance, H2233 is Zara. And it's, it just means seeds. It's, it's, it's seeds. That's, that's what is the root of the word that they spoke of. And that's Zeran that you find in H2235. I thought that was fascinating. That when they said, give us pulse, they were saying, give us something that is sown. Give us something that is a seed. Because they knew and had an understanding, having been taught by their mothers, having been taught by the scriptures, that there was something special about the seed. And notice what it says here. 
It says, Daniel and his associates had been trained by their parents to habits of strict temperance. They had been taught that God would hold them accountable for their capabilities and that they must never dwarf or enfeeble their powers. This education was to Daniel and his companions the means of their preservation amidst the demoralizing influence of the courts of Babylon. Strong were the temptations surrounding them in that corrupt and luxurious court, but they remained uncontaminated. No power, no influence could sway them from the principles they had learned in early life by a study of the word and the works of God. Friends, I'm telling you that God wants us to study this book because God had prepared them before they ever got into a time of trouble. And the way that he prepared them was he gave them a special diet. And let me tell you something. I'm not trying to step on anybody's diet. But if we want revival, we need to look at revival in light of survival. Because something's coming. And if we don't start to make the changes now, we are not going to be able to be vessels of honor unto the Lord as the Bible talks about. God wants to put his spirit in us. And if we talk about hope, the only hope we got is found in Colossians chapter one and verse 27. Christ in you is the hope of glory. Christ in you, the hope of glory. May he get his seed in us by, the way, of, by way of his indwelling spirit. And may we have power in these last days. May we go forward to conquer in these last days. May we show the world, like in the book of Daniel, that we'll stand when our civil liberties are being threatened. That's what's coming next. When that's happening, we will stand because we stood just simply on the test of diet. When it comes time, when we're told to, to either bow down or get in the fire or don't pray or we'll be thrown to the lions, we will stand because the Bible tells us, as I mentioned before, he that endures until the end, we shall be hated by all men for God's, Jesus' name's sake, but he that endures until the end, the same shall be saved, the Bible tells us. May we be able to last through all the difficulties that come our way in the same way that Daniel and the Hebrews boys did because they understood something so special about God dwelling in them and that he would give them not only power, but he will give them understanding to know the time that we're living in. And that's what we need. We're going to talk more about having this spirit tomorrow as we look at, are you thirsty yet? May God bless us. I will pray and then I will take some questions. Father in heaven, thank you so much for the idea that you've given us the seed, the seed of the woman. And this dwelled within those Hebrew boys who were able to stand the test of time and through all difficulties. We've got some difficult days coming and Lord, we need your spirit. May we begin to plead for it and cleanse our vessels so that even the word may speak to us clearly. I beseech you therefore, brethren, by the mercies of God, that you present your bodies a living sacrifice, holy, acceptable unto God, which is your reasonable service. This is our prayer in Jesus' name. Amen. 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 Praise God. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Praise God for you, uh, Elder, Pastor, man of God. We thank God for using you in a powerful way this evening. And uh, what a word. What a word. You tied it all together and reminded us of our unique call as the people of God for the last days and tying the health message with the three angels message, the right arm of the gospel. Thank Amen. you so much. Thank you. Um, now, uh, we just want to provide an opportunity for folks to uh, ask one or two questions, um, and we want to open up for that. We're not going to be long, maybe five or seven minutes or so, to see if we can ask a couple of questions, and then um, uh, we'll have Pastor Rico Hill answer our questions, and we'll see how many questions we can get answered. Who, who will be first? Who has a question? Just raise your hand in the chat. Avril will turn you loose. And give you a chance to ask your question. Because the chat, if I turn into this one. Or you can talk if you're, if you're, if I'm, I'm hearing somebody mumble. If you're, 
<laughs> if you can hear yourself and if you're free, you can ask your question. Uh, can, you, can you show us that book that you were recommending? Uh, certainly. It's called Eat to Beat Disease and it's written by Dr. William Lee, this guy right here. And he is a, um, um, uh, a scientist, he's an MD, but you, I would start with watching his, uh, his TED talk, 20 minutes of just riveting information. And he goes through um, uh, collard greens and broccoli and all the things that's, you know, that you can find in your grocery store uh, produce section. And he was talking about angiogenesis and how to fight cancer. And, and, and then he came to a conclusion and this book came out after that. He says, you know, if you really wanna fight cancer, you can do it from the produce section. Mm. And it, it's amazing. You'll see it when you watch the, uh, when you watch the YouTube uh, presentation, the host of that program as people are giving just uh, um, applause and giving a standing ovation to the information she came out and she says, well, tell us more about the, um, the drug therapy. So that was quite suspicious, but it's very interesting that while he was saying, nothing does it better than what you get from the produce section. And then he came out and said, tell us more about the drugs. <laughs> <laughs> well, thank you. <laughs> thank Anybody you else? It's excellent thank book. you for your presentation. Praise the Lord, praise the Lord. Amen. Amen. <laughs> Amen. How do you, uh, are you saying, Doc, uh, um, that uh, collard greens and tail are, are everyday uh, meals or uh, what's the serving size? Uh, how frequently? How much? How do we determine that? I, and I'm assuming you, you can't eat too much of it, but uh, what would be the recommended? Well, well, collards uh, tend to um, show from the science in terms of the bioactives of the amount of sulforaphane in it. And that is the um, chemical compound that's found in this particular uh, family of vegetables that collard greens have the most. Uh, hello. <laughs> I think about collard greens, I'm telling you. I think with all the other stuff that we do with sugar and all this, uh, collard greens might be the thing that's giving us just a little more life. <laughs> <laughs> but, um, but but they're not not just collard greens. Um, kale, you can put them in your salad. Some for certain things, kale is excellent raw, and then for another thing, it's excellent uh, um, cooked, steamed. Uh, so in the same way, like for men, um, tomatoes are excellent for your heart if they're raw, but they're excellent for the prostate for men when they're cooked. So it all depends. So you mix it up a little bit. But it's not just the collars and kale, you know, cabbage. Um, so you, you, God wants us to have a variety, right? We want to have a variety of things and including, um, you know, your, your lettuce, um, the, the best lettuce. And watch this. Again, it all goes back to just how things in nature are representing and revealing the character of God. Um, you find that the best lettuce that you can have, which is, you know, also falls in that family, um, is a uh, red leaf lettuce. You've seen that lettuce? Yeah. The one that's green toward the bottom, but as you get up to the top, it's red. red. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> and what they have found is that the more they open themselves up to the sun, the more they get color. And color, just like they always said, the black of the berry, the sweet of the juice, or the dark <laughs> of the vegetable or the fruit, the more nutrients in it. So right. I, I'll tell you this one. This is a this is a freebie. Uh, Purple carrots. Purple carrots. Yes. I don't even eat the orange ones anymore. Um, they're like three times as much nutritional value. Listen, we need to be at this time eating in a way that is going to give us health and strength and a strong immune system. And uh, as you find these high uh, nutrient dense foods like purple carrot over the yellow ones or the red or the orange ones, you find that you're actually getting much, and carrots are a great cancer fighter as well. Purple carrots. Right. Mm -hmm. yeah. Anybody ever had purple carrots? Yeah. 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 Mm -hmm. Amen. Amen. Yeah. We don't get them as often, but uh, every now and then. 
That, that's because they're a little more expensive. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> they cost a little more. Yeah, but hey, you know what? I tell you, uh, what is the price of our health? That's right. That's right. Amen. 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 Into organic foods altogether. You know, I I, I don't like to uh, push the whole organic thing. They have something they call the dirty dozen. Yeah. Uh, the dirty dozen includes kale, uh, peaches, strawberries. Those things you want to avoid because they're very porous. But you don't have to get organic bananas. You don't have to get or organic uh, pomegranates uh, because those things have um, you know a, a, a peel that doesn't allow for the spraying. To actually penetrate apples are part of the dirty dozen so you know as as much as possible you know you want to get those uh without the chemical spray and all the pesticides that's on them because it gets okay. into the food and that's also carcinogenic and can lead to cancer all right thank you so much sir we appreciate you sir and uh tomorrow night we'll have a couple more questions for you praise god for everybody being on board tonight and uh, for the information that we receive now, it's a matter of application. That's the key, folks. Uh, we should be shopping differently uh, and cooking differently. Uh, we've come through the 40-day fast, uh, and so it should be a little easier for us now, having disciplined ourselves over, the, over these last 40 days uh, and restricted our intake. So let's move forward by the grace of God and um, trust that uh, God's word is true that his ways are right and what he has provided is the best Amen. right so Amen. let's let's move on that let's look to the lord in benediction father god in heaven thank you so much for being with us this evening and for giving us the insights that are needed for us to be healthy and strong now lord um give us the courage and the will to practice what we've heard uh so that we'll be able to reap long-term benefits to your glory and to your honor. In Jesus' name we pray and thank you. Amen. 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 Thank you, man Amen. of God. Appreciate you. God bless. See you tomorrow. Pastor. All right, everybody. Good night. God bless. Pastor. Good night. Yes. Just before you, just before you jump off, I've been monitoring the um, attendance here um, for the one on, on Zoom. Um, when I last looked on, on Facebook, there were about 11, and I saw six on. I'm going to call you immediately yeah. after and ask you to do something for me. But in addition to that, I want everybody to know that the six o'clock, I thought we had said that, and the announcement reflected that we would not have the six o'clock um, session for this week. We are going to resume at six. Uh, starting next Sunday. So we are so we're doing seven uh, o'clock now. Yes, Pastor, we are asking everyone to just take note of that. And then I'm going to call you and ask you to do something for me, Pastor. Okay, no problem. Sounds good. Otherwise, Thank you, sir. Pastor. Pastor, yes. Pastor do, yes. a 50 on, do a 50 on Zoom earlier. Okay, so we had 50 on Zoom. And, and, and 23 on YouTube. 23 okay. on YouTube. Okay. Yeah. All right, praise All right. God. So Thank that's you. 50, 22, and 11. Uh, yes. At uh, almost 90. <laughs> yeah. 